Over the past few decades, the West of Africa has emerged as a relentless spring of footballing talent. Other than a handful of nations in the north of the continent, no one comes close to matching the West's achievement on the international stage. Cameroon, Ghana and Senegal have all reached the World Cup quarter-finals, Nigeria and Cameroon both tasted Olympic gold, and Liberia produced a Ballon d'Or winner in George Weah. Talent from across the region has flooded Europe's top leagues at an unprecedented rate. But why has the West become so good recently at producing footballers? And how has the rest of Africa struggled to keep pace? Let's find out. Football was introduced to Africa by European colonists in the 1860s, and it wasn't long before the entire continent had fallen in love with the sport. This created a rich cultural connection with the game which has survived for generations. It is, however, impossible to ignore how colonialism would influence West African football even once independence was restored, in particular in the Francophone nations, which today make up the continent's biggest footballing presence worldwide. Over the years, cultural similarities and migratory links have meant that footballers from former French colonies like the Côte d'Ivoire, Mali and Senegal have headed to France to ply their trade. This includes Mali's Salif Keita and Cameroonian great Roger Miller, who both represented Saint-Étienne during the 60s and 80s respectively. To this day, Ligue 1 and Ligue 2 have the highest number of African imports per season of any league in Europe. For almost a century, players of West African descent started appearing in the French national side. Mali born Jean Tigana played a huge part in the Blues midfield alongside Michel Platini that would win Euro 84 while Marcel Desailly and Patrick Vieira helped the French to World Cup glory in 98. Two decades later and 12 members of their World Cup squad in Russia had links with West Africa. That includes Samuel Umtiti and Kylian Mbappe, who both have roots in Cameroon. Sadly, East Africa hasn't enjoyed the same level of prestige despite an equal passion for the game, with the fallout of colonialism again lingering near the heart of the problem. As independence was restored across the continent, the Portuguese, Belgians and French continued to recruit players from their former colonies, but Britain followed a different path. Contrary to the French Football Federation, in 1931 the English Football Association introduced a protectionist approach, which made it harder for non-British professionals to gain a residency qualification. Although this was removed in 1978, for the best part of the 20th century, Britain rarely accepted so-called foreign player nationals. This appears to have particularly hurt Commonwealth states in the east of Africa, who suffered from the closed-door policy and lack of recognition. Combined with instability and limited domestic league structures, the region struggled to unlock its potential. The journey of Aston Villa striker Mbwana Samata highlights the lack of clear trajectory available to the best East African footballers. Born in Tanzania, Samata had to eventually play for TP Mazembe in the Democratic Republic of Congo in order to join the Belgian migratory path to Europe, heading to Genk and finally the Premier League in January 2020. In doing so, he became the first Tanzanian to appear in the English top flight, following Kenya's Victor Wanyama and a handful of Burundians as the only East Africans present in the division. While the East was shut out, the success of the West African diaspora on the international stage inevitably began to catch people's attention. This was accelerated in 1974, when Brazilian Joao Havelange was elected as the head of FIFA. Efforts to develop the game in Africa included the introduction of various international youth championships, which could serve as a showcase for some of the continent's brightest talents. To date, Nigeria have won the Under-17 World Cup five times, more than any other nation. This only intensified interest in the region and so commenced a period of morally questionable investment in West Africa as agents and academies went hunting for the game's next star. Years of attention mean West Africa boasts some of the strongest facilities for player development on the continent. Various national academies have sprung up, as well as internationally owned and private facilities. For example, the Kaji Sports Academy in Cameroon has been credited with discovering stars like Stefan Mbia and arguably Africa's most successful ever player, Samuel Etu. Over in Senegal, Diamba FC helped produce PSG's Idrissa Ghanegé and former Crystal Palace defender Pape Soiree, having been founded in 2003 by a consortium including Dakar-born Patrick Vieira. The Arsenal legend features on a list of stars that have invested in the region, along with Etu, Marseille hero Abedi Pelé and former Brest midfielder Madi Touré, who founded Académie Génération Foot in Senegal. Over the years, Sadio Mane, Watford winger Ismail Assar and ex-Newcastle forward Papi Cisse all passed through its doors, while it benefits from an exclusive deal with Ligue 1 side FC Metz, which sees two prospective talents head to France every year. Five members of the Maroons current squad come from Senegal, with a further eight more from across West Africa. But France isn't the only nation looking for talent in the area. 
The Kaji Sports Academy maintains partnerships with the Spanish duo of Atletico Madrid and Sevilla, while in 1999, Dutch giants Feyenoord founded their facility in Ghana. Portuguese clubs have also maintained a presence in their former colony of Angola, and even Qatar reportedly has around 6,000 staff in the region working under the banner of their Aspire Academy. Selling players into Europe and beyond is good business. However, exploitative and neo-colonial practices continue to plague player procurement in West Africa. Throughout the 90s, predatory agents exploited the precarious socio-economic climate in certain countries by bringing young players to Europe in a process the UN would later describe as effectively creating a modern-day slave trade. The drain of talent also wreaked havoc on domestic football infrastructure in the region, preventing the creation of professional leagues and labour protection. In contrast, in North Africa, financially stable nations like Egypt and Tunisia have been able to resist the predations of European countries and have been able to provide greater salaries and incentives to stay within their structure for longer. Under the rule of Sepp Blatter, FIFA regulation in the late 90s and early 2000s attempted to stem the tide of illegal movement out of Africa. Compensation for players under 23 was introduced and purchasing of any under-18s banned. And in 1997, the African Champions League was developed by CAF in order to provide more lucrative competition. However, trafficking is still rife, and in 2019 it was estimated around 15,000 children were brought into Europe by agents under the false pretense of becoming a footballer. One example is former Watford and Forest Green striker Al Bangura, who was the victim of trafficking out of Sierra Leone as a teenager. What's more, many believe that academies have merely provided a method for European clubs to circumvent player purchase regulations. While many facilities are created with positive intentions, some unlicensed and foreign-owned academies exist for the sole purpose of pumping young talent into the more lucrative world leagues. What's more, lofty transfer fees received for African stars by European clubs rarely trickle back to their homelands. That said, one academy often hailed as a model example is that of Côte d'Ivoire club Asec Mimosas. Founded by former Monaco president Jean-Marc Guillou in 1993, the Asec Academy has provided the backbone to a golden generation of Ivorian footballers, including the Touré brothers Jovinho and Romaric. Located on the outskirts of Abidjan, it was the first European-styled football academy in sub-Saharan Africa, with students between the ages of 13 and 17 receiving a rounded education. The academy proved so successful that by 1999 the ASEC first team were both Ivorian and African champions, with a side consisting predominantly of graduates. The best players were then sold on, such as Solomon Kalou to Feyenoord and Didier Zakora to Saint-Étienne. ASEC also established a link with Belgian side Beveren, which provided a European platform for their best talents to grow. Colo Torre and Emmanuel Aboué both followed this path before joining Arsenal thanks to Arsene Wenger's relationship with Guillou from their days at Monaco. Between 2006 and 2015, the Côte d'Ivoire reached three African Cup of Nations finals, claimed one title and qualified for three straight World Cups, all with ASEC players at the elephant's heart. It's a sad fact that for many children, a career in football is one of the few paths to financial security, but the lure of fame and wealth can't be underestimated. An example of this can be found in Nigeria, in the infamous Lagos neighbourhood Ajagunle. Though largely known for poverty, Ajagunle means the place where riches dwell, and has been producing footballers since the 90s at an exceptional rate. Odio Nagalo, Brown Idei and Obafemi Martins all emerged from the area known locally as AJ City despite the odds being stacked against them. A BBC investigation in 2017 revealed that football is often a solace for the young away from the difficulties of daily life, while a grassroots league system exists to provide the children with a taste of competitive action. As a result, Ajagunle has become a hub for scouts seeking out talent who can't afford a spot in one of Nigeria's top academies. It's said not a single Super Eagles squad is complete without an AJ City prodigy, who emerged to stardom from the most extreme conditions. And this desire to succeed is reflected in Nigeria's growing presence within the game's economics. A report by the CIES Football Observatory in May 2020 found that Nigeria was the 11th biggest player exporter in world football, the highest in Africa and above heavily developed footballing nations in the Netherlands and Portugal. Three other West African nations in Ghana, the Côte d'Ivoire and Senegal featured in the top 20, and that number is expected to rise in the future. Above everything, West Africa has an incredible history of producing talent, and combined with a culture that's crazy about football and the escapism the beautiful game can provide, it's no surprise to see it emerge as an epicenter for global football production. It's just important that it's nurtured responsibly and fairly going forward. So that's our take on the current state of football in West Africa, but which region would you like to see us look at next? Let us know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, drop us a like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell to never miss a video. We'll see you next time.